Hello everyone, my name is Tracy Poulin Dunn. I am the Vice Chair of the Ontario Workplace Health Coalition. You can find us at our website at owhc.ca. That's owhc.ca. I hope you're having an absolutely fantastic day. I know I am because I get a chat with Dr. John Yardley, uh, founder of Metrics at Work and formerly of the Department of Applied Health at Brock University in Ontario, Canada. Uh, and I'm also chatting uh, with uh, Bonnie Harrow. So Bonnie is a workplace wellness consultant uh, who helps organization create strategies uh, for their organization and leadership teams to help improve employee health. And as we all know, employee health is not only a great thing for the person, but for the business owner and leader because it translates to higher customer service, uh, better uh, patient experiences, higher quality of delivery, and stronger business reputation. The OWHC has the privilege of hosting John and Barney at an upcoming event on November the 19th, which you are all invited to attend. Now, you probably caught there that I said the word patient. Yes, patient. Creating a culture of workplace health is vitally important for all of those working in our healthcare sector. And it just so happens that uh, Bonnie and John have worked extensively in healthcare organizations. So hopefully we can get them to chat a little bit more about that. So let's get right to it. Thank you so much for joining me, John and Bonnie. We're happy to be here, but we do want to say one thing. Our combined 80 years of experience, it's all Bonnie's, not mine. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. That's right. It's only been five years for John. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Okay, so Bonnie, um, maybe we can start off with you. Uh, given your experience as a workplace uh, well-being consultant, what are you seeing right now as far as the opportunities uh, for employers that they might be missing in creating workplace health? Well, I think um, there's a real disconnect at the moment. And uh, I came across a great book by Patrick Lencioni, and it's called The Advantage. Um, and it talks about two requirements that organizations have to have to be successful both now and in the future. And if you can just visualize two columns, on the left side is the word smart. And uh, under that are things like strategy, marketing, IT, finance, technology. Those are all the smart components of an organization. On the right-hand side, uh, it's the title is healthy. And that's where we get into minimal politics, minimal confusion, high morale, high productivity, low turnover, all the things that are really difficult to measure and pin down and actually change. Um, and Patrick Lencioni says that in order to be successful, you've got to have organizations that are smart and healthy. Um, and it's not that CEOs don't know about the healthy side. Um, it's just that the smart side is really easy to measure and manage and, and reach out and touch. So, um, when I, I had actually the experience of working with a large healthcare organization in the US, um, and they really were struggling with the results of their employee engagement and satisfaction surveys. They were a fantastic uh, hospital, beautiful facility, really well managed, uh, but I think they could have done better. Um, and just to give you a practical sort of example of how this plays out is I went in um, with a team and we looked at all their surveys that they had done both with clients and staff. And we tried to figure out what the trends were. From that, we also looked at their strategic plans, what their senior leaders wanted to put into place. And then we looked at what they were doing now in workplace well-being and health promotion programs. We looked at what, what they were doing, what it was costing. And we put all that together and we came up with a, a corporate well-being program that wasn't just limited to the usual health promotion, but it was really to build the bridge to the healthy side of that smart and healthy equation. Um, and it was pretty successful. So I think um, it can be done. I've seen it done uh, more than once. Uh, and I think that's where uh, CEOs, leaders, organization staff need to start looking because it's not enough to have a smart organization. If you want to survive in the future, you've got to be healthy as well. That's probably, I think, how I... I 
put it into place. Thanks so much, Bonnie. Uh, John, I'm going to ask you the same question in a second, but I want to focus, Bonnie, just on something that I heard you said, say, um, health promotion. A lot of companies focusing on health promotion. So, you know, well, um, mindfulness, resilience training. Help me understand um, those components as far as health promotion and how they fit into what you're talking about. I think it's the best way to think about it is maybe two levels. So the first level of health promotion is diet, exercise, having an on-site gym, putting in fatigue mats for people that are standing for long uh, hours. Those are sort of what I would call level one health promotion. And then as a second level, in my mind, I see it as a well-being, which is beyond health promotion. Well-being uh, tries to integrate a number of factors. And I'll just give you some live examples of what we, we did in this one hospital. Um, for example, one of the things in the survey was people were out of touch with the senior leadership. They didn't know who their leaders were. People want to know who's running the, the organization. So we put in something called Mocha Mondays, which was uh, specialty coffees delivered to a unit by two of the senior leaders. And they basically handed out coffee, free mugs, and talked to the staff. They asked them what they needed on the units, uh, what work was like, really plugged in both ways and that was a, a huge win in terms of just um, changing the, the corporate culture from everyone in boxes and oh those are the brass to they're actually delivering coffee so that's it also sends a message message of servant leadership uh, another one was um, mini massages on the units. So um, down the street, there was a, a massage school and I just we got into the car, a couple of us, and drove down to the massage school and said, how would you like to uh, offer your massage training on site on our units? Um, every week and rotate it through the whole organization. That was hugely successful. We all ended up only having to pay for the uh, the instructor um, and the four or five folks that came along, the massage students, who I wanted to say were also healthcare professionals already. So it was nurses sometimes that wanted to enhance their skills. So these were pretty qualified people, three or four at a time. And boy, was that ever successful in terms of just changing the whole vibe on a unit once they all had massages. Um, hospitals are high touch organizations. Um, we had one unit that didn't want to be touched. I mean, can you imagine it was in the emergency um, department and these people are touching all those patients that are coming through and they themselves were so stressed, they couldn't stand to be touched. We eventually got them to do hand massages, but um, it's that type of thing that is, is sort of beyond your usual diet and exercise. Right. And it, it, you know, that was a very good explanation of how you're uh, marrying health promotion in with corporate culture and getting to those organizational issues, which may be impacting uh, employee well-being. So awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, John, can I ask you the same question? Uh, from the work that you've done today, what is the one opportunity that you see employers are missing in creating a healthy workplace? It's hard to um, add to what uh, Bonnie has already gone through, but I'd, I would say if I could go rather than one, two things. Uh, the first one is that I don't believe that there's a good integration of what uh, Bonnie talked about as being smart and healthy. So the business side of the organization is well known by the senior executives and by the leadership of an organization, but they don't have as good a feel for the healthy side, uh, which is you know all of the things that could be uh, named in psychosocial ways. Uh, more so than the physical, which they do have some understanding on because there's legislation in place that's been around for a long time, which is more the physical side. Now, it's only recently been adjusted to include things like the social side. So it's this integration, I think, is a major uh, factor that's lost because at the strategic level, it's not brought to their attention and done in a way that provides for the whole of the organization to see the alignment for managing people better. That's really what it comes down to in terms of the first point I'd make. The second point is that those at the peak of the organization or the leadership, the executive, fail often to see the more granular parts of the organization, which is where the services and products are made. And so when they aggregate information together, they lose the granularity, they lose the specificity, they lose the focus of seeing what's happening inside their organization. And so I would argue the second opportunity is better understanding what's happening in the front line. And Bonnie's example of the Mocha Mondays 
would be an example of where leadership gets out of their comfort zone, out of their office, out of executive meetings, and goes and meets and greets and talks literally somewhat informally to people in the front lines. And it, they walk away with a better understanding for having been there than they do by looking at aggregated information or data. And I think those two would be what I would say rather than the one. Excellent. Well, you, you talked there about granularity and getting those, you know, really crunchy bits with what's going on to be able to help those senior leaders understand what's going on. So how do you go about diagnosing an organization? Um, sorry, but just can jump in, Tracy, just one last point on what John was saying there. Um, the key ingredient of all of this is fun. And uh, I know it, people kind of say what, but I think if you're going to take that health promotion to the next level, uh, it will be much more engaging if it's fun. And I'll give you an example, a uh, last example on this question. And that was, we took over the screensavers that people were looking at. Because when we, I got to the hospital, um, it was all about needle stick injuries and all about education and information. Um, and uh, you couldn't get away from it basically. So these poor caregivers are giving care to the patients, trying to take care of themselves get through the 12 hour shift and every through few seconds on their computers, all of them throughout the organization, there were 600 of them, they'd be flashing all this education. And it's not to say you're anti-education, but we took those screensavers over and put in really fun messages. You know, if it was Mother's Day or Father's Day or Thanksgiving. And, and actually when we first took over those screensavers, someone thought that the, the uh, organization had been hacked into actually, because they were all fun messages. Um, but it really, it started to lighten up the culture a lot and it got the message that we can be playful as well and not always take ourselves so seriously. So I just wanted to add that in terms of um, if you're trying to, to move the culture. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Because right. if, you're, if you're not going to, if you're not having fun in the workplace, uh, it's, it's a really awful place to spend a big part of your life. So yeah. Um, John, can I just kind of go back and revisit that granularity piece of it and um, how you go about getting that granularity and diagnosing an organization? Yeah, so, and, and it's much easier for me to show this if we had something like a diagram. But if I could tell you that inside all organizations, if you disaggregate them into their frontline units, you have the entire organization arrayed as a series of groups. So they might be your teams in smaller organizations, they might be the departments. But if you could see all of those, no, none of those are the same as the others, all right? There's huge variation inside organizations. So when we take organizational information, which is an aggregate, and often it's an average, we just see a single number representing everybody. It's like saying all men are the same, all women are the same, you know, all people of color are the same. These are huge generalizations and it doesn't really work. So the notion of disaggregation, in other words, trying to understand what's happening group by group by group is really important. And therein lies the nub of it. To a large degree, anything you're going to do in the way of trying to create culture that's different from what it currently is or creating change so that things are healthier or socially more um, a, a positive for, for people, you have to literally do it unit by unit. Because when you try to press down from the top as an executive, your energy and what it is that you're trying to do gets uh, uh, pushed right across the entire organization and it's a light touch. Whereas if we look at it unit by unit, you can get tremendous change opportunities and you can actually create more change. And importantly, it won't be the executive doing it. It'll be the staff and their manager. And so that's unit by unit by unit. So that's the granularity I'm talking about. And that means all sorts of things in terms of what people are responsible for. It's not your HR department. You know, it's not your senior leadership. It's the supervisor and his or her staff taking responsibility for creating a less toxic, more supportive, more respectful, more helpful work environment and seeing that as being part of the job. I mean, it shouldn't necessarily be written into a job description, but I sometimes think it should, you know, that we should be team players. You know, that's one of the things that we're required to do when we're working in a team. And so maybe it should be written into our job descriptions. Amen. That's the, gran that's the granularity. Excellent. So is there um, a process to kind of that you use to get to that level of granularity? 
Yeah, there's multiple ways of doing that. You know, most of the people who will be listening to this will be familiar with employee engagement surveys. It used to be called satisfaction surveys, culture surveys. You know, they virtually have many of the same elements in them. And importantly, and uh, actually Bonnie mentioned this a few minutes ago when she said, you know, one of the first things they looked at was that information. What I would say, though, is that when you look at that information, you have to see the variation inside the organization. And, you know, when I'm doing measurement work, I'm often trying to get people to understand that there's two components. Everybody understands the measure of central tendency, the mean, the average, the median. But what they don't take time to look at is variation. Where there's variation, where there's difference, there's opportunity for learning about things that are good and about things that aren't so good that need to be changed. And so really importantly here is the whole notion of being able to capture information and show the variation and to work out what's good and what's not so good and then work on whatever's good as being your strengths you need to maintain and the things that aren't so good are the things that need to be changed. And so if I could take it back to the teams, we need to do that team by team by team in order to understand where the strengths of the organization lie and where the opportunities or the challenges are. You're talking a lot about what's good and what may need to change. It sounds a little bit to me like culture. So Bonnie, can you help me understand how all of this is mixing into uh, creating a healthy culture? Well, culture is, is really important, I think. Um, more organizations that I've gone into, I realize that, you know, as soon as you walk in the door, um, you can tell, is it a culture of fear? Is it a culture of innovation? Is it a, a welcoming culture? I mean, all of that permeates throughout um, in terms of how people behave, how they treat each other, uh, the whole thing. And it's, um, you know, when you when you visit an organization, you've got sort of a front row seat to that culture. Um, and a lot of organizations, I don't think, are necessarily aware of that. Um, having said that, um, I think the way to approach is, is maybe not to keep saying that culture is our target. We're going to change it by next week. It doesn't really work that way. And um, I was speaking this morning to John about uh, the work of Edgar Schein, who he tells me is called Ed Schein, who is now 91 years old, and he's known as the father of organizational culture. Um, and he says, it's got a wonderful quote, and I'll just read it quickly. It's He says, the worst way to change culture is by focusing on changing the culture. Yes. The best way to proceed is to create conditions that foster the desired thinking, assumptions, and behaviors. Um, and I think that's probably, I mean, my experience has been to try and be aware of culture, but structure uh, the work that you're doing in uh, in the well-being and the workplace um health promotion programs to dovetail with that. So everything you do uh, has to be checked against the strategic plan, the direction, um, what what the staff are looking for, um, and then you build your programs from there. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the world is changing so quickly now. Uh, I think there's a new acronym called VUCA. I think you and I had talked about it once, Tracy. Yes. Um, which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it's a term from the 1990s uh, in the military, actually, the U.S. Army War College. Um, but if that's the backdrop for um, where organizations are and what they're facing, I don't think that's going to change very much. We're better off, I think, um, sort of being the, the author of our own future and to start dis disrupting ourselves. Because I think if you take you know, the traditional workplace wellness programs and try and take them to the next level, it's going to be disruptive. Uh, and it's gonna take, I think, a lot of courage and support and, and really being able to veer away from fear um, and, and to do the right thing um, that I think people want if you wanna keep your staff and especially the millennials, like the new generation are looking for that. So, Tracy, if I can jump in, I, I wanna add something to what Bonnie said. Um, and I don't want to say that what Bonnie said doesn't make sense. Of course it does. But I think we've got to be clear that culture is not a unitary concept. It's not something that you see throughout the entire organization. We make the generalization that a organization has a culture, and in some instances it's fear, or maybe it's fun, or maybe it's something else. But the reality in the lived experience is that there are subcultures. 
Right. So the culture will be exemplified brilliantly by one group, but there will be a toxic group somewhere inside that organization that does not live that culture. And so for me, and it gets back to this second notion I was trying to talk about, the need to go granular. We need to find out where the culture is not playing out the way it's supposed to be. And that will be because the, tri the tribe, the clan, or the team that's there has not aligned itself with the values of the organization and has a separate set of values that it's playing out. And it's really important for us to be able to diagnose that, understand it, and then try to do something that's going to have a, an effect in that localized area. Because that's where the variation comes in again. There's All of the teams will display the culture of the organization to some extent, what we want them to do is to display it to a greater extent. And so that's a part of what needs to be done. And so I'll always talk about subcultures. As soon as someone talks about a culture, as if it's a mainstream one unitary concept, I say, no, it's there's subcultures everywhere inside organizations. And of course, at it's that it's most granular. It's individual people's values, beliefs, and what they consider to be their normative uh, behaviors which is, is a way of understanding culture. Oh, guys, this is such a treat to be able to talk to you. I could talk to you all day. Um, why should people attend uh, the OWHC session on November 19th and come and hear you guys speak? Well, I think it's an opportunity to explore, and I'd like to um, look at some paradigms uh, that need to be um, – understood where we can move in terms of workplace well-being workplace health and also share um, a real life experience that um, that I've had in terms of going into an organization and trying to figure out how to move their dial um, one program I developed was called la vida which means life in Spanish and the tagline was la vida more than a living and uh, that's what I would like to invite people to come and and join in and uh, see the exam Examples and and perhaps get new ideas and and go back to their organizations to create and innovate and uh, really take you know workplace health to the next level. I think that's that's I would invite them to do that. And I would say that uh, Bonnie is the doer, and I'm perhaps the, more along the analytical side. She's also the fun side of this partnership. <laughs> Will be. <laughs> I, I'm I, I'm just the numbers fellow, so you know I'm pretty damn boring. But what what I'd like to say that people might get is some understanding from the way in which you can actually try to measure some of these things, uh, try to disaggregate the data to understand variation inside your organization, how that can start to point you in certain directions where, for instance, then the Levita types of programs might have an effect, uh, because that's the sort of program that follows the analysis. And of course, the analysis can also be used after the program to try and evaluate whether there's been any shifts, whether there's been any improvements, whether the problems that were there before have uh, not necessarily been dealt with, but maybe uh, dealt with at least in part and things are on, on an improving trend. And so with the analytics, you can provide some feedback, particularly to senior folks, but also to staff about how things have shifted. Because the interventions, the, the services that, that are put in place by really smart, thoughtful people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how they try to improve work environments. So, so I would say if you come, you're not only going to get the do piece, but you're also going to get how you might understand where problems are and also therefore uh, also have a, a, an analytical side to how you might also evaluate whether there's been a change. Wonderful. Thank you very much. As always, a pleasure chatting with the both of you. Okay, thank you. Talk Take to care. you soon. Bye-bye.